uh, we were willing to go to the uh, outskirts of the town with an Indonesian flag and welcome the troops. There was a small left-wing uh, student group that refused to do that. I was part of that. Uh, so <coughs> we, this small group uh, looked with considerable suspicion at the Japanese, which turned out to be right. Well, because while in the first two weeks uh, Indonesian flags and the Indonesian national anthem were allowed to be played, after two weeks they clamped down and forbid it all. Mm. And then it, well, uh, uh, on the radio, it was only propaganda for Japan as the elder brother, older brother of the Indonesians. So uh, what, what, what led us to, uh, you know, and then uh, they insisted on Japanese uh, teaching staff and they could spoke a little, speak a little German or a little, a little Engl English. Uh, and we having been educated by Dutch, knew English and German better than they, than the teachers did. So we didn't learn anything. And then one day, they decided uh, our hair should be cut. We're very happy to welcome to Duke University the very distinguished statesman, former ambassador, Sajid Mokko of Indonesia, who has had a tremendous experience of a, uh, of a global scope. Uh, this is part of the Duke University Living History series, and uh, our guest today is the former ambassador uh, Mr. Sochimutko. In this dialogue, we also have some other distinguished guests. On my right is Dr. Crawford Goodwin, who's James B. Duke Professor of Economics and former Dean of the Graduate School, who's had considerable experience in Indonesia. And next to him is the, is the current Dean of the Graduate School, also Professor of Economics, uh, Malcolm Gillis, who lived for some years in Indonesia. So we're very happy to have both of these uh, distinguished scholars participate in this dialogue. Ambassador Sojimotko has had a most unusual career, spanning a variety of professions and interests. He started as a journalist, was a member also of the Constituent Assembly of his country, Indonesia. He subsequently served as an advisor to the Ministry of Planning of his government, also in, uh, as an advisor to the Foreign Minister, was then appointed the Indonesian Ambassador to the United States, and most recently has completed an eight-year term as Rector of the United Nations University uh, in Tokyo. We're very happy indeed to have you here, Ambassador Sajimotko, and uh, um, uh, as a participant in this Living History series. I wonder if you would care to comment, first of all, on the legacy of Dutch uh, colonialism in Indonesia, uh, particularly with reference to contrasting it to British, the British colonial <laughs> experience in India, with respect to the legacies of, of an infrastructure such as a civil service, a judicial system, language and the like. We'd be very, very happy to hear about that. Yeah, there, there has been, or there, there is a great difference between the, the British legacy in India uh, and uh, the Dutch legacy in, in Indonesia. Uh, the Dutch, uh, the, the British left uh, behind on, on, uh, the concept and, and a really functioning independent judiciary. Uh, the Dutch never did. The judiciary was an instrument of the governor general, with, uh, handled with great arbitrariness. Um, the, the British left behind a uh, uh, highly skilled civil service uh, of, of the highest ranks. In Indonesia, the, the Indonesians in the civil service are uh, only uh, uh, what is it, had uh, experience at middle level, at middle level uh, uh, jobs. Um, the, uh, Brit the British left a, a very uh, elaborate uh, uh, educational system as well. In Indonesia, uh, by the time the Dutch left, uh, there may, um, the number of university graduates may not have been larger than 500 people. So uh, we had very uh, much of the difficulties that we have had in the past uh, are derived from that very thin infrastructure. And it was no wonder that uh, uh, although we had come out of the revolution with a multi-party system, uh, within 10 years after, the, uh, 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 after our uh, proclamation of independence, 
the uh, parliamentary system collapsed, um, and uh, uh, President Sukarno uh, took uh, power and uh, tried to adjust the political system to what he thought would be the uh, Indonesian needs and traditions. It was a sort of authoritarian, uh, mild or authoritarian rule. Uh, in the end, he couldn't hold the balance between uh, the um, uh, Communist Party and the army, and in the end, and that led to the destruction of this particular uh, forum, which he called guided democracy. So, uh, the, the 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 great difference uh, with India is that uh, uh, Indians, uh, there were many more Indians experienced in the in the in dealing with government at the higher reaches. Uh, that experience we never had, except for the Japanese period, uh, when, because uh, the Japanese uh, needed Indonesians to man the, the top functions in the governmental bureaucracy, uh, uh, which the Dutch had kept to themselves. Pakoko? You knew Sukarno from the time you were a very young man yes. until his death in uh, the late 60s and early 70s. Can you pr provide us with some of your own personal insights into the complex nature of, of this man and his views toward other liberation movements and any dialogues he may have had with Ho Chi Minh, Chou Enlai, Mao? Um, yes, Sukarno was a very complex man. He was, but he was in the first place a very warm person and a great intellectual. He was widely read. Uh, he liked uh, uh, intellectual discussions, even with young people like me at that time. Um, he was very open uh, and, and accessible. Uh, and he was a magnificent orator, uh, even though I rather early on uh, started to disagree with his political views Every time I listened to him at a mass meeting, um, I, would, I would have to resist with all my powers to not to be swept away by, by his rhetoric. I have um, listened to some tapes of uh, Hitler's speeches, but I think uh, uh, Sukarno was a greater orator than, than, than Hitler was. And, and there's no wonder that he, that he could hold the allegiance of, uh, of people despite uh, the very high cost uh, in terms of human lives uh, of his collaboration with the Japanese. Uh, he justified it uh, uh, because uh, it was the only way he saw for us to gain independence. I asked him one day point blank, uh, very early on, in, my, in fact in, uh, during our, the first meeting I had with him, why he collaborated with the Japanese. And he said, uh, well, because uh, they have promised me three things which the Dutch never even wanted to discuss with us. That is, independence, a parliament, and an army. And so we had a great uh, debate about, about that and, uh, and about the, uh, the course uh, that the war was going to take. He was absolutely convinced that uh, the Japanese would win the war. And uh, I told the president then that uh, this was just shortly after the battle at Gur el Kanar, that from then on the Japanese would be pushed back. Uh, and in fact, the, 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 that first discussion ended by him telling us, uh, pray, God, pray, pray to God that we will still be alive five years from now, then come and see me and tell me who was right, Sukarno or you. <laughs> it was the beginning of a great friendship. Uh, uh, which lasted a long time uh, until actually the time that he took over power. He wanted me to join his cabinet and I declined and so, and that broke our relationship. He early on, um, he, had never, uh, he had never been uh, abroad until he became president, uh, different from uh, people like pres uh, Vice President uh, Hatta. Vice President Hatta had met uh, Ho Chi Minh and in 1928 at a meeting of the Anti-Imperialist League. Um, so when, when uh, the Indonesian Revolution began, uh, Ho Chi Minh sent a letter to 
Vice President Hatta, inviting him to join our two revolutions and to coordinate our two revolutions uh, in order to strengthen our fight. Um, Vice President Hatta gave the letter to the then Prime Minister, Sultan Shahri. And uh, when I asked him about, uh, asked the, uh, the Prime Minister about his, uh, what his response was going to be, he said, I'm going to ignore the letter. I won't send a reply. And I was <coughs> furious. I asked him, how can you do that? Uh, uh, this is a betrayal of the Asian Revolution. He said, no, I'll tell you why. Um, he said the Dutch uh, are, mil uh, in, in, mil in a military sense, a weak power. As long as uh, uh, we can avoid uh, that our military strength is completely destroyed, we will win because the Dutch cannot afford a protracted war. Uh, moreover, uh, our nationalist movement is being led by nationalists, while uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, uh, in, in, in his situation, the Communist Party leads the nationalist movement. So they have more enemies than, than we have. Also, France is a major military power, even though it was defeated in World War II. Um, so they can, they can afford a much longer war, a much greater war effort than the Dutch ever could. Therefore, we will gain our independence earlier than, the, than, than Vietnam uh, uh, will, and it is uh, as an uh, independent nation that we could help them much more than anything we could do now. Uh, I was disappointed. I mean, I mean, not knowing enough. I was a young, a very young man. Um, I was disappointed with the answer, but uh, it turned out it was a, a correct response. The only thing that, that didn't work out was that by the time uh, our independence was internationally recognized. Uh, the Prime Minister was no longer in power and we had a, an, uh, a government with a different orientation. So we, 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 we didn't give Vietnam the kind of help that, that many of us had thought would be, would be essential. But the prediction uh, was correct. Uh, the, uh, it took the Vietnamese much longer to gain their, to get their independence accepted. Um, um, what else is there to say about Sukarno? Uh, he genuinely believed that an, a revolution had its own dynamics and that the role of a leader was simply to, to let the re revolution run its course and then uh, guide uh, the social forces, so to speak, uh, to uh, his own goals and aspirations. He compared the revolution as a runaway horse, uh, which had to be allowed to run its course because you couldn't, you couldn't steer the horse. The task, he said, of a leader is to, to try to stay in the saddle until the horse has exhausted itself and then you could steer him wherever you want him to go. Opposite to that view was the view of a man like Sharia, who also recognized the blind historical forces that came, that, that would come bursting uh, out of old structures. Uh, but he felt it, uh, that the, he felt that the responsibility of a leader was to tame those forces and to direct them uh, uh, immediately and as soon as possible to democratic and uh, uh, humane ends. That, that the, so there were all the way through the revolution. There have been these two streams of uh, of uh, different uh, uh, concepts about the nature of revolution. You know Shahir well. So yes, Shahir, uh, he was one your, of my teachers. Also. One of your teachers and your brother-in-law. Yes. So you knew him at least as as well as you knew Sukarno. Yes. Uh, his place in history. Do you think that that's been? Do you think that his place in Indonesian history has been? as widely recognized as perhaps he deserves? Shariers, yeah. you mean? No, he has, uh, he has I think, uh, later historians and, and, and uh, uh, <coughs> uh, future generations, I am quite certain, will have a much greater appreciation for what he has done than uh, people have now. 
I mean, after all, uh, Sherry was the embodiment of uh, uh, democratic aspirations, the aspirations for freedom as against independence. Um, uh, and uh, no, we, we, we should realize how difficult it is and it has been and will continue to be to govern a country as complex as Indonesia. Uh, it is so vast, it is uh, so, uh, there are uh, so many different religions and uh, uh, cultures uh, uh, brought together in this single nation and, uh, of, of 6,000, 12,000 islands. Uh, uh, Indonesia is a very difficult country to govern, and so the tendency has al uh, the, the tendency has always been to centralize power to to in order to to maintain some semblance of uh, of order and rationality in the allocation of resources and so forth. As against those centralizing tendencies, uh, there has always been uh, the desire to be freer, and as uh, we move forward in the in the area of uh, economic development, and a new middle class begins to to come up. Uh, the desire for greater freedom and greater access to information, freer access to information, is uh, has increased and is bound to increase more. And uh, in that context, uh, people are bound to, as is beginning to happen now, to reevaluate his role. Uh, and to see themselves more as extensions uh, of uh, the aspirations that led him. He sounds like, in many ways, like Cho and Lai. You must have conversed with Cho and Lai many times during your uh, career. No, you uh, I've met him only at the Bandung. Yeah. Uh, I've met him only at the Bandung conference, and I was then a junior. Uh, I was a delegate to that conference and a, a junior delegate to that conference. So I. I uh, only had one brief conversation with him. I've asked every senior statesman that I've ever met who I thought had encountered Cho in line about him. And the, 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 the best statement I ever heard was from a senior Indian uh, civil servant ambassador who called him the greatest civil servant who ever lived. Hmm. Well, uh, I think he was more than a civil servant yeah. because he was in uh, one sense uh, a person with a very broad uh, range of uh, of uh, intellectual interest and uh, sensitivity. You know, uh, uh, he came through in this uh, during that conference as a as a, as really a leader with a, with a broad vision of the world. Um, um, so I, I I think he's more than a civil servant, and I think his history, his personal history, has proven that. Uh, Coco, you've touched on the uh, relationships <coughs> of Indonesia with the two major imperial powers that controlled it in sequence, uh, the Netherlands and Japan. Can you reflect on what the unhappy termination of those two relationships have meant to Indonesia in, in recent years? Clearly one is a, a member of the European community and the other is the rising economic power in Asia. H have these uh, unfortunate memories affected the, uh, the links that have developed between Indonesia and uh, modern state. And, uh, between Indonesia and... And, and uh, the Netherlands on the one hand, uh, Europe and, and uh, Japan. Uh, no, one of, the, one of the rather surprising things is how short people's memory is in Indonesia. Uh, uh, I think in a way it reflects the sort of tolerance uh, that is part of uh, Indonesia's culture. The relationship with Holland, although very bitter, uh, uh, in the in the beginning, uh, now have been replaced by a warmth and an, uh, an, uh, an a really friendly relationship. Mm. Um, uh, most Indonesians, when they go abroad, try to touch uh, the Holland on their on their trip because that's where they feel uh, at home most. Certainly for the older generation, and maybe I'm the last of that older generation because the younger, uh, younger people uh, don't speak Dutch and uh, uh, never had any experience with the Dutch. Uh, what lingers on is the, is the impact of the, Dutch, of, the, of, the, of the Japanese occupation. I think they have left a legacy of, of rather uh, militaristic, fascist, uh, inclined thinking of, 
uh, strong leadership, uh, uh, the very tight discipline, um, uh, and very little tolerance for, uh, for dissenting opinion. Uh, it has affected, I think, uh, the evolving political culture in Indonesia. Of course, traditional factors have also played a role. Uh, uh, both countries have uh, committed considerable cruelties uh, during their uh, period, uh, and especially with the Dutch in the course of our fight for independence. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying that on, in, on the Indonesian side there were no, no atrocities that were committed, uh, but um, uh, to take just one instance, uh, because the Dutch, uh, because the Japanese thought that they could retain uh, direct uh, influence on on Kalimantan, on on Borneo, uh, they on one day just uh, gathered up all all the people who had an education higher than primary school and shot them and their families. Um, memories of this kind have not uh, lasted very long. Uh, to my surprise, uh, the relationship with Japan is now quite good. Um, we have, there has been, and there uh, is about to, co to continue to be, a uh, sort of constant fear that Japan will once again become a military power, and then uh, uh, people would feel very uncomfortable uh, under such conditions. But otherwise, the relationship is quite good. Uh, there has been a fear of Japanese economic domination, but uh, uh, during the world recession, uh, uh, many Indonesians came to realize that it would uh, living without Japan would also be very difficult. So uh, there's greater tolerance now. Uh, I think we have grown up a bit more as a as a nation. Um, the relationships with both countries is very good, uh, but one one never knows uh, the major changes that are in the offing in the Asia Pacific region. Uh, leave uh, us with many questions uh, on, for which uh, the answers are still not available yet. And so we'll have to see how those things develop. As a young uh, Indonesian intellectual growing up through this very exciting period, can you reflect a little on the forces that shaped uh, your own uh, thought processes. Uh, you've obviously had contact with yeah. socialist thought and, and Western liberal thought. Well, um, um, I, from my second to my seventh year, I grew up in Holland uh, because my father had gone to Holland on a fellowship to get his uh, PhD in, med in, in medicine. Uh, then I was not aware of any discrimination. The moment I came back, even as a boy of seven years old, uh, I realized that we were not on the same plane as the Dutch. And uh, that was the, uh, that started a process which made me realize in the end that at one point we had to fight for our independence. So that began very early. Uh, when I grew up, and I, I grew up in rather privileged conditions because of the position of my father as a, as a medical doctor, um, uh, I had uh, uh, an, uh, a very privileged education, uh, good teachers. Uh, uh, one of the teachers, in fact, uh, spent Sundays with a small group of, of, of students uh, to tutor us in, uh, um, in uh, Western civilization, uh, Western culture, European culture. Uh, art history. Uh, it made me realize that there was more to Europe and Western civilization than the the rather uh, uh, what is it unattractive face of Dutch colonialism. Uh, I I still have a, a sense of very grief, deep gratitude to this teacher of mine. Um, then, as I grew up. Uh, uh, I felt a bit an outsider, in part, uh, uh, primarily because I had difficulty sharing the hatreds and the prejudices in, 
of uh, many of my fellow students. Uh, and uh, it made me very timid in a way in uh, my in uh, developing my any role in the in the student movement uh, until in the Japanese time I realized uh, I saw how many uh, of those who had expressed so much hatred for the Dutch uh, were willing to become lackeys of the Japanese yeah. and <laughs> That gave me that gave me the sense that I that I had an equal right to speak about on behalf of Indonesian nationalism than any of those loudmouths who 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 turned out to have no backbone, uh, you know. So it took me a while to gain the self confidence uh, to speak uh, uh, as uh, uh, or to 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 feel that I had the right to speak uh, as a nationalist. At that time, I also. Uh, read uh, 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 what is it? A number of uh, uh, books on history. Uh, there was a very uh, a world famous Dutch historian, uh, left wing, a Marxist historian. Uh, I uh, I read avidly everything he wrote. Uh, there were also uh, straight communist literature, often handwritten copies. Uh, of Lenin, some of Lenin's pamphlets and so forth. I've read them, uh, I've read most of them, many handwritten copies because it was forbidden literature. Um, and so I became attracted to, to what was then a left-wing part of the nationalist movement. The nationalist movement was very, was very uh, divided, uh, ranging from quite pro, uh, pro-fascist, uh, uh, parties to uh, left-wing Marxist and communist uh, parties. Uh, all that was uh, wiped out by by the Japanese who uh, went for a single party or single um, organizations that would be helpful to them in their war <coughs> effort. And I stayed out of those. And um, in fact, because. Uh, 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 because of my political views and activities as a student, I was expelled from medical school where I studied, and uh, uh, but retained my contact with uh, what what became uh, one of the centers of uh, revolutionary uh, preparation. Uh, so uh, when the f nuke, when when the first atom bomb fell in Japan. Um, a messenger came from Jakarta, from from uh, Shahrir, in fact, to say, "Be prepared for us to declare our u independence unilaterally. We are not going to wait for a Japanese-sponsored uh, uh, independence declaration." And uh, in fact, at, at uh, one provincial radio station made such a proclamation. Um, of a democratic Indonesia, free Indonesia, and so forth. The attempt to do the same uh, with the central radio station in Jakarta failed because the the man to whom this task was entrusted uh, got nervous and wanted to wipe off his sweating hands and took his handkerchief out of his pocket and uh, his gun fell out of the out of his pocket. So he ran away. <laughs> that was, and then a day afterwards. Uh, uh, the official uh, uh, declaration of independence came. But it was uh, this kind of experience that made me uh, uh, realize uh, uh, the importance of uh, political values. Um, the the uh, destructive uh, power of hatred uh, that power, that hatred, uh, distorts one, one's own, one's own perspectives and uh, one's own soul, really. And in this, I owe a lot to my father. I had quarrelled with him once when I was 14 years old. I wanted uh, him to add to my um, uh, monthly, how do you call it, allowance, monthly allowance because I wanted <coughs> to subscribe to a nationalist journal. And he forbade me. And I said, how can you forbid me? I, I said, and I asked him. 
you have been preaching to me about about freedom, uh, political freedom, and personal freedom, uh, inner freedom, and you're forbidding me to read this innocuous journal. And he said, and I asked him, do you want me to join the nationalist movement or not? And he said, I want you to join the nationalist movement, but only after you have learned how to fight without hatred. Hakoko, mm -hmm. you were a delegate in 1948 to the UN Security Council yeah. uh, when the effort was being made to begin settling the, the revolution in terms of international recognition. Yes. <clears throat> How did you see the, the posture of the United States, and in particular, I believe Dulles was involved? Uh, no, no. Uh, that was before. It was uh, Atchison. Atchison. Mm -hmm. And our history books tell us that the United States was very supportive of Indonesian goals. Uh, and the <laughs> Dutch were, yeah. were very angry with the United States for pressuring them. How, how did you see it? Uh, well, uh, that description is correct. Uh, only for the fi final period of our struggle. Uh, at first, America was quite uh, open in expressing its support to the, for the Dutch. The American priorities at that time were the quick restoration for Europe so that it could defend itself <coughs> and, uh, uh, against the, uh, in the Cold War or against the uh, possible threat of the Soviet Union. And uh, Asia was absolutely uh, an, uh, of a lower priority. And uh, the State Department made it clear in our first visit uh, to the State Department uh, uh, that uh, they liked, Americans liked the Dutch, and the Dutch have a very good reputation here, and uh, uh, Europe has to be uh, quickly restored first. Uh, it was, uh, I think, the so-called loss of China in 1949 that made the United States government realize that unless um, America came to terms with anti-colonial nationalism, they might lose the whole of Asia in, 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 in those terms then. And I think that accounts <coughs> for the switch because from then on, uh, the American government started pressing the Dutch to negotiate with us and to no negotiate sincerely. And when the Dutch resisted and, and started a second uh, military operation against Indonesia, America openly took the side of the Indonesians and insisted on a quick uh, negotiated solution. Uh, the American government even threatened the Dutch government that it would withdraw its economic aid if uh, unless the Dutch would, uh, would negotiate with the Indonesians. And so, uh, uh, in, in a way, we owe the switch in the American position to what happened in China. And, and uh, the impact of, uh, of external influences on the relatively short history of the Indonesian Republic has been very profound all the way through. Indonesia has a number of uh, what might appear to be conflicting or certainly overlapping international responsibilities and alliances. A member of the of ASEAN, for example, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, also a member of the Organization of the Islamic <coughs> Conference as, as one of the great Islamic ummah throughout the world, uh, indeed one of the 46 members of the conference. I wonder if you can give us any kind of uh, analysis with respect to its, its view of the Islamic world generally and its membership in it as opposed to its various links within Southeast Asia, which is essentially non-Islamic? Um, well, I think in the first place one should realize that although um, in statistical terms the, uh, Muslim, the Muslims in Indonesia constitute a uh, majority of about 80 percent, there's a large group of Protestants and Catholics and uh, Hindus and uh, Buddhists. Uh, in Indonesia, uh, and because of uh, Dutch uh, policies in the religious field, um, the Protestant had been assigned particular areas, the Catholic had been assigned other areas, the Hindus and the Buddhists, of course, uh, were there before the Dutch, so uh, they were just there. Uh, we 
uh, very early on came to the realization that if we wanted to maintain the unity of Indonesia, uh, no religion should be, uh, be should become uh, should be recognized as the dominant or the state religion. How to reconcile uh, that requirement with uh, the very profound loyalties of people to their own religion in Indonesia? That question was, in a way, resolved by uh, uh, formulating Indonesia as a uh, non-theocratic but also non-secular state. Um, uh, President Sukarno had, had devised an, uh, a slogan on the basis of a, a new national ideology, the Pancasila, the, the five principles, the first principle of which is the common, uh, uh, the common acceptance of uh, 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 of 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 God, uh, uh, the common recognition of God. Uh, that was the first uh, um, um, the monotheistic God, and that has uh, made it possible for the Muslims and the uh, Christians. Uh, to live uh, together quite uh, peacefully on the whole. Uh, that has been also the reason why Indonesia was for a long time simply an observer to the organization of uh, Islamic states, and, uh, because it, uh, uh, it wanted to be very cautious in uh, dealing with this problem. And uh, I don't think uh, any Indonesian government for one moment could f uh, can afford to forget uh, the existence and the interests of the of the other religions uh, apart from the Muslim religion. Fakoko, um, in the separatist movements in the 50s in West Sumatra and North Sulawesi, do you? How is your assessment of the way the uh, Sukarno handled that, or maybe how the military handled it? Was he? out in front, as it were, on the question of suppressing these uh, movements, or did the military force his hand? You may not like what I'm going to say, but um, uh, it was, I think, the CIA who pushed the, the rebels into open rebellion uh, uh, by with all kinds of promises, including and, and, and money. Um, uh, what happened was, uh, it, uh, these movements were not separatist movements. The, 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 the movements were uh, uh, movements for greater autonomy and uh, to, uh, when they declared the rebellion, to develop a counter government uh, uh, to replace the central government, not to separate from Indonesia, from other parts of Indonesia. Uh, the fear was, <coughs> on their part, <coughs> that the central government had become much uh, too much influenced by the Communist Party and that Sukarno uh, had, uh, had lost uh, a great deal of power to the Communist Party and that it would be very uh, um, impossible for him to maintain the balance that he had been uh, trying to establish between the power of the Communist Party and of the army. The army was very much uh, Western oriented um, and uh, the Communist Party uh, in the um, schism between China and the Soviet Union had, uh, had uh, uh, shifted its, uh, its allegiance to, to the Chinese uh, Communist Party. Um, uh, the, the question arises, of course, why, why did Sukarno allow the Communist Party to, to gain so much power? Again, this has something to do with his concept of a revolu revolution. Uh, a revolution has uh, a revolution is a revolution because of the emergence of new social forces. Whatever the label of the social forces, whatever the direction of the so social forces, his job was to maintain a leadership position, and then later on try to move things his way. And so. Uh, when he saw that the other political parties, uh, what is it, uh, uh, lost power against the, the very aggressive uh, Communist Party, he he uh, uh, accepted that. Uh, but 
also try to develop a an, uh, an, uh, greater, a stronger position for the army. Uh, it was only when, when uh, there, uh, there was open rebellion, a declared rebellion, with a counter-government, that uh, the army felt uh, forced uh, to uh, take action and overwhelm the, the rebels. The rebels had been given, uh, supported by the CIA with arms, uh, and these are, these are facts, uh, you know, when one of the flyers of such a plane had been shot down and uh, 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 brought before the court in Indonesia and so forth. And it was an open secret that, that uh, um, Clark uh, Air Force Base was a major basis for the supply of arms to, uh, to uh, the rebels in Indonesia. Somehow, at one point, the Americans realized that they were betting on the wrong horse, that the army in the end was still the, the best, uh, the most reliable ally of the, for, for, for the United States. So what happened was that uh, uh, the American government stopped supporting the rebels and uh, threw their weight behind uh, uh, the army and the official government. Uh, it had no, no, uh, not much of a policy at the time. Uh, so uh, it was certainly not Sukarno who, who pushed uh, things towards the civil war. Uh, I, I in, uh, I'm inclined to see him much more as the the, the victim of uh, of forces he had helped generate and could not control. In September, I've been told by several in the military that in September 1965, uh, these were people who were in, in Sumatra, that uh, an invasion force of gliders was poised to be towed across the isthmus and to invade Malaysia. I've never known what to make of these stories. Oh no, oh no. The the uh, the army, the armed forces were very reluctant uh, to make any effective military move against the uh, against Malaysia. Uh, there was not much sympathy for Malaysia, but uh, as far as the army was concerned, and so far as I understand it, their enemy was not Malaysia. Their enemy was the Communist Party, and so uh, they were often. Uh, reprimanded by Sukarno for doing so little. This was the Air Force? That was, was this was uh, both the Army, the Air Force, and the Navy. In the end, I think the Marines sent uh, a few saboteurs uh, who were arrested and then hanged uh, uh, by uh, the Singapore government. Uh, so, uh, uh, in, in, in many of these cases, Sukarno was not uh, uh, the one who who pushed things to a climax. And he was the victim of, uh, he, he lost power, he had lost a great deal of power, uh, also mental power. He had an, uh, a kidney ailment uh, that was beginning to bother him and, this, and I think bother his mental processes. But uh, 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 no, but at that time, yes, it was, um, it was time of Foster Dulles. Uh, uh, to him, neutrality in the Cold War was a sin. I mean, he has said it uh, uh, li uh, so literally. And so uh, there was an inclination to try to destabilize the Sukarno government. Mm, later on, I think, uh, uh, a more sophisticated understanding of the forces in, in Asia began to develop in the, in the U.S. government. Coco, you've, you've mentioned in several of your comments in the last few moments, the, the, the force both of uh, <clears throat> socialist, communist ideology in the development of your country, and also religion uh, as, a, as a force. Can you reflect on the relative weights of these different ideological forces at the present time and where you think they may go in, in future years? <laughs> that is not a simple question. Um, why was the influence of uh, of socialist and communist thought so great uh, in the beginning of the nationalist movement, it was simply because uh, Marxism provided the best uh, explanation of colonialism uh, that was not humiliating uh, 
to the natives, to, to us. All other explanations uh, sort of derived from uh, concepts of racial inferiority and so forth. Uh, the Marxist explanation was an honorable explanation to explain our dependency. Um, I think that has been a very important, and it was the only explanation that was really acceptable. Um, so no wonder that uh, um, a large part of the of the political public had strong uh, Marxist sympathies. And uh, in fact, at the beginning of the revolution, uh, the socialist and the communist parties uh, were one. Um, it was the outbreak of the Cold War which uh, split uh, the left-wing movement in Indonesia between democratic socialist and, and communist. And um, so it is another example of how, how deep the intrusion of uh, external influence has always been on, on the evolution of Indonesian politics. Um, Islam, of course, uh, has always been a uh, force that the Dutch feared. Uh, uh, Indonesia, though, it, it, uh, it is located far away from the center at that time of, uh, of Islamic thought and uh, uh, or new Islamic thinking and so forth, and uh, uh, modern Islamic thought. Um, uh, the Dutch uh, tried as much as possible to keep uh, the Muslims out of the Indonesian elite, to keep them out of uh, the uh, little educational system that they, the, the small educational system that they allowed Indonesians to have. Uh, it was the Japanese who were determined to make the Muslims an ally of theirs. And they opened the door of the bureaucracy uh, and the, of the uh, political movement supporting the war uh, uh, for the Muslims. So the Indonesian elite has broadened as a result of Japanese policy. And uh, uh, it has uh, given Islam a permanent place in Indonesian uh, uh, politics. Before that, it was always uh, subdued, worked against it by, by uh, the the, the Dutch had established a special bureau for Islamic affairs, and one of their great Orientalists, uh, Snukur Kronje, uh, uh, provided the intellectual leadership of how to deal with and how to emasculate, in a way, uh, uh, the, the Muslim part of the population as a political force. Um, how, did, how did they do? What was what were some of his tactics? Um, by uh, a step by uh, encouraging the rural Muslims who were less politically sophisticated uh, to organize themselves as against the <coughs> urban Muslims who had been strongly influenced by uh, the modernizing uh, thoughts of a man like uh, uh, Muhammad Abduh in, uh, in, uh, in Egypt. Uh, the modern Muslims uh, were traders. Uh, they were urban, uh, and they were, uh, and they established uh, their own educational system, uh, modern, modern educational system, as against the uh, traditional rural Muslims who continued to uh, work through uh, the traditional educational system of uh, reading of the Quran and and, and so forth. Uh, he. Uh, as a result of the, the way the colonizers uh, perceived the threat of Islam, uh, the Dutch uh, made it a systematic effort to uh, provide good education to the Javanese nobility or semi-mobility uh, nobility uh, uh, for, and, and to give them opportunities for Western education, excluding the Muslims. So there was this, this gap was created uh, and uh, uh, only uh, 
gradually, and as I said, primarily because of the influence of the Japanese, the Muslims uh, became an open political force supporting the Republic, and it's one of the very important things. As different from Iran, the mullahs in Iran were kept out of the modernizing movement in <coughs> Iran, uh, whereas uh, the Muslims in Indonesia are part, have been part of the revolution, have created, uh, were, were, were active uh, participants in the, creating, in the creation of the Indonesian state, and therefore they have a sense of uh, belonging, a sense of responsibility for the maintenance of that state. That was absent in, uh, in, in, in countries like Iran. Uh, as a result, in a way, I think the, the, the kind of uh, fundamentalist radicalism uh, one finds in many other countries in, uh, in the Islamic uh, world uh, does not have, it's not very strong. There is an openness, I find, in, uh, among young Muslim intellectuals to the world, an openness to other religions, uh, which uh, uh, is not only astounding, but very heartening. It, are you suggesting that uh, with the fading memory of uh, imperialism, that Marxist doctrine will have less and less appeal to young Indonesian intellectuals? And if so, is there any other ideology that's appearing on the horizon to capture their imagination? Uh, no, it's, it's one of the problems. Uh, I think Marxism and communism certainly has lost much of its appeal, certainly with the uh, recent developments in China and in the Soviet Union. Uh, it's almost intellectually laughable to, to remain uh, doctrinaire uh, uh, Marxist or, or communist. The world has moved beyond, beyond that. Um, so, uh, uh, but at the same time, uh, there is a void, uh, a void that has been, uh, effort has been made to fill that void with the Pancasila ideology, uh, that is an ideology that, that uh, primarily tries to link or to keep uh, the, the ties of unity among such di diverse uh, uh, cultures and religions in Indonesia. And in a sense, they have uh, that ideology has uh, uh, has been effective. But uh, I believe also that uh, a national ideology has a lifespan no longer than one and a half generation. Uh, uh, as a younger generation grows up in entirely different circumstances, uh, 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 the belief in 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 a particular ideology uh, diminishes. It has happened in the Soviet Union, in China, in Yugoslavia. Uh, it is also happening in a way in Indonesia. And uh, uh, we'll just have to see uh, uh, to what extent broader interpretation of Pancasila or uh, other other thoughts that might be that might be incorporated in uh, in in that state ideology could uh, reawaken uh, interest and commitment to a uh, national ideology. It will be hard, uh, I think. Uh, on, on the whole, I, I should say I'm averse of uh, ideologies. Uh, it is uh, generally represents a simplification, an oversimplification, and a reductionism uh, that I, I, uh, I, I don't particularly like. At the same time, I see the need for uh, a number of, of simple principles that can, that can hold a nation together. I don't think Indonesia will, will uh, ever become a uh, strongly ideologized nation. I don't believe that, uh, let's say, uh, 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 a, 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 a new, let's say, radical nationalism or uh, Islam could become the unifying ideology of Indonesia. Uh, it would break Indonesia apart. I assume from what you say the influence of Saudi Arabia is minimal in terms of building new mosques, establishing an international Islamic university, which they've done in many other countries, the number of, yeah, of haji of pilgrims yeah. who... The who number of pilgrims <coughs> is increasing in Indonesia. 
uh, but that <coughs> has not been accompanied by any commensurate increase in influence of, uh, of any Middle Eastern country. Uh, in fact, uh, more and more I have the feeling that Indonesian Muslims are looking for their own solutions rather than looking at anything in the Middle East for a solution for their own country. We've been talking about Indonesia. I wonder now if we might uh, look at the world scene generally. We're aware, of course, that the, the bipolarism which has prevailed for so many years is now uh, uh, disappearing and we're probably entering into a phase of, of global relations which can be called, let us say, multipolar if not quadrupolar, which uh, will necessarily change the notion of foreign policy, strategy, economic relations and so on, not only of your area but indeed of the world at large. I wonder if you can comment on the effects of this new change in global power relations on, on Southeast Asia generally. Well, that is a large uh, question. <coughs> Uh, certainly, I think we are uh, moving into a very fluid world situation in which uh, uh, there will be many uh, power shifts. Uh, certainly in an economic sense, uh, there is multipolarity now with the rise of Japan and uh, Germany and Western Europe uh, generally as uh, major economic powers. Uh, there has been a weakening of the American position. I think Japan is now uh, the, the paramount financial power in the world. Um, there are the newly industrializing, uh, newly industrialized economies, the four dragons, uh, uh, that have uh, uh, also uh, changed the uh, uh, patterns of uh, trade and economic uh, influence. Um, but it is at this stage quite difficult to draw, uh, to draw general conclusions about the way in which, we, in which the world is moving. In fact, there are so many contradictory uh, factors operating and contradictory trends that are visible that any general conclusion drawn now would be wrong, I'm sure. Um, take, for instance, uh, on the one hand, one has the globalization of the of national economies and uh, the uh, emergence of a of a really uh, global economy, um, uh, and uh, together with the information revolution, it seems that we uh, are moving towards a world without boundaries. At the same time, one sees uh, uh, manifestations of new economic nationalism uh, with various degrees of protectionism. One sees it in the United States. Um, one sees it in Europe um, and uh, um, uh, also accompanied by tendencies towards uh, economic integration. Uh, the United States with Canada, maybe in 10 years time or so with Mexico, who knows. Uh, there is the European effort at integration. We really don't know uh, uh, what the outcome of these conflicting tendencies will be. It may be that they are not mutually exclusive. We don't know how things will work out. Um, but uh, 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 one thing is certain, that is that, uh, that the world will be an entirely different one. <coughs> now, how does this affect uh, the uh, relationship with the third world in which ASEAN is part? Um, the what is, uh, I think, the most, uh, the most um, worrying uh, uh, development to me is the growing gap uh, between uh, the economic strength of the North and of the, of, of the uh, developing nations because of the very rapid rise in productivity uh, in the industrial world as a result of, the, of automation, robotization, and so forth, the impact of the information revolution. Uh, uh, true, it's true that uh, some developing countries have benefited, have been able to utilize uh, these same new factors and uh, the rise of uh, the four dragons uh, uh, reflect that of uh, uh, South Korea, Taiwan uh, and um, uh, Hong, Hong Kong and Singapore. Now it seems that, uh, um, that Thailand uh, uh, may be one of the, one of the new dragons. Um, Thailand uh, 
is beginning to think of uh, the Southeast Asian mainland, including Vietnam, as a potential market for its uh, economic uh, production. Um, when the wave of Japanese investments uh, in search of uh, cheap and skilled uh, labor uh, may reach uh, the other countries in ASEAN, I don't know. It may well happen or it may be overtaken by more rapid um, uh, technological developments, which uh, tendency which also exists of uh, moving a number of uh, uh, industries back to uh, industrial countries, uh, um, a move that is made possible uh, by the uh, jumps in productivity as a result of, uh, of automation. Um, the, uh, the, the gap between the north and the south seems to be growing wi wider. It seems to have acquired additional dimensions. Uh, it is no longer only a gap between the rich and poor countries but also between uh, those who have access to modern knowledge and those who don't have access to modern knowledge, and between those who, uh, between those who have work and those who don't have work. And the, 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 the direction in which uh, technological evolution seems to go uh, is towards labor saving, while uh, the number of unemployed uh, uh, becomes bigger and bigger, especially in the south, but also in the north. So uh, we are moving in a world which is not only uh, changing in terms of the configuration of economic and strategic power, uh, but also in a world where uh, we have to address uh, new types of problems. Mm, the, the problem of uh, what to do with the unemployed, uh, uh, can we develop new concepts of work? Can we develop new concepts of leisure? Uh, uh, is it possible to, to gain or to develop a, a, a concepts of work or non-work that are, that are uh, considered respectable and uh, legitimate and rewarding? Mm, uh, the arts are, of course, one, one area uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the kind of uh, individual activities that uh, is accompanied uh, with, uh, with pride and creativity and, and, and so forth. But uh, uh, one cannot expect the half of the world to become, uh, <laughs> to become artist uh, altogether. Uh, in any case, there are going to be uh, many uh, new problems. Uh, uh, one set of problems that will that will impinge on the manner in which the world economy may develop uh, might well be the environmental constraints that uh, become more and more visible. In the first place, it is no longer possible for uh, any developed country, developing country to uh, look at its development effort in isolation of uh, uh, with what, what is happening to the world economy, uh, the impact of the world economy and its uh, very erratic uh, uh, movements um, have affected and will continue to affect uh, the national development effort. The globalization of the economy makes it impossible for any any businessman in the third world or in any other country to establish uh, his business and maintain and, and nurture his business unless he knows uh, the, the global market and unless he knows uh, who his uh, competitors are. Uh, nationally as well as transnationally. Uh, so uh, major shifts in uh, the manner in which uh, uh, economic activity will uh, evolve, uh, I think, are in the, in the offing. Uh, the, the, the nature of corporations or the, the form of organization of corporations may change because uh, unless an organization becomes uh, uh, information uh, intensive and capable of handling uh, large amounts of information uh, with a very quick response time, uh, uh, corporations will just uh, lose their market share. Uh, so mm, uh, that is one set of, of changes that are in the offering and to which everyone will have to adjust. Um, 
but uh, more seriously, other, other environmental constraints. Uh, uh, I think even governments now begin to accept uh, the inevitability of uh, 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 the um, uh, global warming mm, and uh, uh, they're beginning to have conferences about, about these problems uh, in effort to look for, for uh, policies, appropriate policies. Uh, but, uh, and there's a drive towards greater uh, energy efficiency. However, most of the studies do not take into account the uh, absolute uh, determination of third world countries to industrialize also. Already now, China is the third largest uh, CO2 producer in the world after the United States and the USSR. Uh, what happens uh, to, the, to the greenhouse effect if uh, China is fully industrialized with more than one billion people? and if the rest of the third world is uh, going to uh, industrialize. Any gains uh, in slowing down the, uh, 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 the warming of the earth uh, achieved through uh, en greater energy efficiency will be obliterated by uh, the much uh, larger impact of an industrializing, uh, in a developing world. Therefore, the problem, we have a, a common problem that, that uh, uh, will, will influence the question of uh, whether the human species can survive and whether the human species can slow down and keep uh, and, and, and put a limit to the warming of the earth, which uh, can only be resolved by an, a massive and colossal uh, collective effort of the whole of humankind in search of new technologies that are less uh, destructive to, uh, 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 to the world uh, environment. Um, <clears throat> so uh, both the industrial countries and the non-industrial countries will have to undertake a uh, research effort uh, to, that is delinked from the price of oil, uh, but uh, is measured in terms of uh, what the impact will be of uh, changing better weather patterns on, on agri agriculture, food production, and uh, on the uh, need to move uh, big cities from the, from the um, coastal areas to higher lands because of the rise in sea levels. It is that kind of uh, scale of an international effort that is required. Uh, I don't think uh, the way the world, uh, the international community, or the community of, of nations now functions, that an uh, effort of this scale is possible. Uh, it will require really a an, uh, an, uh, an, uh, massive collective effort that involves not only governments but societies, and a shift in, uh, a shift in uh, values. Uh, 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 reopening questions of uh, the basic meaning and purpose of human life uh, that uh, uh, will uh, emerge and it will have to be addressed as we begin to look for, for a, a new collective uh, uh, <coughs> priorities on the human agenda in the 21st century. Papako, you were speaking of global warming, you were speaking of the environment. Uh, we here recognize that tropical forests are part of your natural your national patrimony, and they're yours to do with as you see fit. The problem is, is when will governments see that is in their interest, their economic interest, <clears throat> not to condone and even to encourage the needless destruction of the forest resources and the animal and genetic material in those forests. Sure, that is a, that is a, major, a major task that uh, uh, the scientific uh, world and the university world will have to address and be more effective in. Um, it is often uh, the lack of, uh, of uh, uh, scientific uh, evidence uh, that has made it easy for governments to go for the short-term gains, the, 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 the putative short-term gains, rather than the long-term uh, interest of the people and of, of their societies. Um, 
the in the interim, I think it would be necessary to to uh, develop incentives for governments to reduce the cutting of the forest for logging purposes and uh, uh, and so also to, to preserve the uh, genetic reservoir that is uh, embedded in these uh, in these uh, tropical forests. Uh, 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 what is needed is an, is a is a is a very great uh, um, uh, what is it effort at uh, political re uh, at at at, at uh, uh, re-education. Um, uh, seen in the in the large we have to learn to live in a world that is no longer dominated by the threat of uh, of nuclear annihilation and uh, uh, constant rivalry between superpowers to a world uh, where all all the whole of humanity has a new threat has to face a new threat uh, the, the the threat uh, to the uh, 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 habitability of 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 the earth uh, and to uh, the governability of, of, of human society as a very um, diverse, uh, 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 a diverse um, uh, unit. Uh, these are very, uh, these constitute very profound shifts in, in values and in uh, valuating uh, uh, profit motives as the dominating or as the central value around which a society organizes itself, we will have to find additional foci for, for the organization of human society. Uh, whether we will be able to do that uh, without having gone through major disasters first is one of the big questions that we have to face. But uh, the only alternative is uh, education, self-education, uh, mutual education, uh, social education, uh, to help us, uh, to enable us uh, uh, to live uh, uh, recently decent lives in the 21st century. I think that leads us to a very interesting question, Coco. Uh, you describe problems which are clearly global in their significance and which are increasing very rapidly. You describe how the modern corporation has responded to this uh, in its multinational form. Yet when we look at the uh, parts of our society which are concerned with education and with research in these problems, we find that still today they are rather provincial, they are oh. national in their, in their focus. How can we somehow bring about a change there? And perhaps you could reflect on your experience with one of the few attempts to go beyond this nationalism in, in education at the United Nations University. Yes, I think uh, we can't afford to let the re-education of human society be left to the educational institutions that we now know. They are too conservative, they are too rigid in their, uh, in their own preoccupations. Um, uh, the, the, uh, a number of timid uh, efforts that have been made at interdisciplinary work in the post-war period have not been able to uh, maintain themselves against the onslaught of uh, uh, what is it, financial pressures, and so they are the first to go. Uh, it's the, the uh, old established disciplines who really hold the power in mo most universities. Uh, of course, the uh, universities are already being compelled to readjust themselves to a changing industrial world and changing uh, a very rapidly shifting labor needs, uh, labor markets. Uh, they have still difficulties in doing that, uh, but some of the, 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 the uh, research part here is, an, is a, a very creative response to, to uh, such a need. Uh, there are other solutions being experimented with, but on the whole, the pace of uh, adjustment of universities is too slow. So the only other solution, it seems to me, is to establish a new kind, a new kind of uh, institutes of higher learning. Uh, 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 which, which, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, which are based uh, on the concept of human solidarity rather than uh, the various degrees of uh, uh, commitment and interchange with governments and national perspectives. Um, 
Now many of the great universities in the world already claim to be cosmopolitan, uh, but uh, the, uh, unconsciously, and, uh, and I'm convinced, uh, many of the national perspectives and insensitivities that each nation and each culture has creep into the orient intellectual orientation of, uh, and, and priorities of the work of universities. So there is a need for, for research efforts that uh, uh, start off from, take off from uh, the concept of uh, the world as a single unit and, and the concept of human solidarity. Uh, the United Nations University is a modest uh, step in that direction. I think it is the, it could well be the precursor of a new type of institute of, uh, of higher learning, a uh, global institute of higher learning. Uh, there are other efforts, uh, the, uh, the Confederate, the ICSU, the, what is it, the International Council for the Science. Sciences, is an other attempt. Uh, so is the International Federation of uh, Institutes for Advanced Studies. Our attempts to get at uh, the new problems uh, in a way that is not dominated by the perspective of a single, of, of predominant powers, of dominant powers. Uh, 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 in the end, I think we will have to, to create such centers in the world. Uh, we can't wait for the universities to slowly move uh, toward in, in, in new directions. Uh, even the, the, as I said, the adjustment to uh, new industrial demands, new uh, labor market demands, is too slow. Do, would, you, would you agree? Would you agree? Yes, I'd agree very much. Uh, from your experience with the UNU, uh, did you have the sense that uh, the job was going to be easier? Can you tell us a little bit about the obstacles that you faced in that uh, um, period of your life? There are, uh, uh, let, let's exclude the financial difficulties. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could talk about that, but that would take a long, a long time. Um, the difficulties uh, that I think are very, very profound are uh, reco the reconciliation of different uh, uh, perceptions of quality and relevance that exist in the world, the reconciliation of different uh, cultural perspectives, worldviews, and um, uh, different ideologies, of course, uh, but also different intellectual traditions and uh, uh, concepts of, uh, of decision making. In some cultures, a decision today may be changed tomorrow if uh, conditions have changed. In other cultures, a decision today has to be implemented, come hell or high water, until the decider decides that it's time to make an adjustment. Um, there are various types. There are various types of management, uh, of the freedom of the, or the expectation that uh, uh, the, the leader uh, only waits for uh, things to come up, to move up to his level, for him to make the ultimate decision. And you have leaders who, who force their bureaucracies to to do things. Now, to uh, uh, reconcile those conflicting notions and to prevent them from becoming personal feuds is one of the major uh, managerial difficulties of an, an intellectual international, an, an intellectual transnational mm -hmm. institution. And, and transnational corporation has one saving grace. It, it has a bottom line. You either make profit or don't, and on that basis, you decide who should be fired and who should be retained. That you don't have in an intellectual institution of this kind. So we'll have to learn to develop ways of, uh, of uh, uh, bringing uh, these diverse uh, cultures into a single harness and still uh, retain uh, the need for, uh, what is it, not single answer and single options, but for a variety of options and the possibility for uh, human society to make choices. Um, I, I think that is the most uh, uh, difficult problem and the least studied problem. If one looks at the, the criticisms uh, towards the United Nations system and the United Nations bureaucracy, I find it extremely interesting that uh, I, I know of no study that uh, looks at these cultural dimensions 
of uh, an international secretariat, um, notions of promotion, uh, national loyalties, uh, group loyalties against the, the overall loyalty to the system, uh, uh, how that operates in terms of promotion and, uh, and uh, internal politics. Uh, uh, I think some, some experts in the area of organization should really study the, those dimensions of the problem rather than uh, uh, drawing up analyses as if uh, the United Nations system is a, is a single culture system. It is not. Um, and the motivations of, of people in such an organization also are different uh, because of different uh, uh, national priorities, uh, different cultural orientations, and so forth. Um, so, uh, I think that is the most difficult problem because sometimes I've been perplexed sometimes, uh, several times, when uh, 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 publications that I, that if I had anything to say, uh, and publications before my time, uh, should never have been published were hailed in some country as being relevant to them. And what do you do? How do you proceed and meet some of those uh, different uh, expectations and perceptions of quality without losing the respect of the established academic institutions in the world? That was another mm -hmm. very, very difficult problem. Uh, and you can't escape it yeah. because if you don't have the respect of, if you don't earn the respect of the established, uh, immediately you become a marginal organization, and uh, and lose any effectiveness <coughs> that you might otherwise have. Uh, so, how to how to steer through these uh, conflicting expectations and criteria, uh, you know, and remain credible. You've had so many different perspectives on the United Nations system, going back to the early days of your career. There's a very widespread sense in this country, as you well know, that the organization is a muscle-bound, ineffective creature stumbling along, and there's talk of a world without the UN. Do you uh, share any of these uh, of these skepticisms oh, that uh, operates I, I, I share many of the criticisms of the system, of the ineffectiveness of the system, and so forth. But to draw the conclusion that uh, the world can live without the United Nations is utter nonsense. Mm -hmm. I think the the, uh, especially in the United States, the disillusionment uh, with the multinational, uh, with the multilateral institutions <coughs> derives from uh, the fact that the United States has lost control. The control it used to have in the beginning, when the United Nations was still a relatively small organization of a small number of, of countries, to this uh, large number of countries that are now uh, uh, part of the United Nations organization. Um, uh, the United States and in, in the West in, in many ways have lost control simply because of the shift in numbers. Uh, it <coughs> gained the control uh, to the extent of its uh, uh, financial uh, contribution and its position in the Security Council. And well, what, what one sees then is that the major economic decisions uh, are taken outside the UN, namely in the OECD. Uh, so, uh, 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 what I see happening is uh, uh, that more and more uh, the United Nations and the organizations outside the United Nations of a multilateral character will have gradually to come to develop a shared agenda and a more uh, coordinated uh, form of decision making. We'll have to learn new lessons about uh, managing uh, uh, these uh, institutions. Uh, there's another factor also, and that is many of the changes that are now taking place are uh, constitute processes of, 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 uh, in, in which governments are no longer in control. Um, Transborder data flows, uh, the, the massive movement of capital, I think, uh, are beyond the control of any single government. Uh, uh, we'll have to learn uh, ways of of making them at least uh, to some extent socially accountable. Uh, how do we do that? Nobody knows yet. Will it be possible for the financial community to 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 begin policing itself in light of certain 
global values uh, of uh, human survival and solidarity that will be required. Mm, nobody knows how to go about it, but it's time that, that people start thinking about these problems. I have a very selfish uh, question, uh, Coco, of a, of a, of a large sort. I'd, I'd like you to reflect, if you, if you wouldn't mind, on your relations with this country. Uh, you've had an extraordinary uh, perspective on this uh, nation for over 30 years. You've come here, I think, almost every year, and you've seen all sorts of parts of the society. I'd be very interested if you would reflect on, on this, the, the events that you have uh, observed. And in particular, if you just mention one that would interest me very much, your role as the first third world trustee on the, on the Ford Foundation board. How did you find your, your role in American philanthropy toward the, uh, the, the third <laughs> uh, I've gone through several phases in my perception of America. It so happened, well in the first place, America has played a decisive role in the recognition, international recognition of independence for Indonesia. That is something that is difficult to forget and it, uh, I'm, I'm constantly aware of that. Um, there have been periods that I've hated America. Uh, that was uh, during the McCarthy period. And at that time I left America uh, uh, totally disillusioned and uh, went to Europe, uh, Western and Eastern Europe, in search of, of preferable ideologies until I realized that uh, uh, none of, of, of those, uh, either in Western or Eastern Europe, were very attractive. Um, uh, but I have come to see America very much as an experimental society. It is one of the few societies in the world that still have an, an opportunity to experiment on a grand scale uh, uh, according to certain uh, principles and certain conceptions about, uh, about the significance of, uh, of human life. Uh, um, uh, as long as America retains that courage, uh, America will remain a major force in the world. The moment uh, the United States uh, withdraws into itself, uh, not only in, an, in a strategic or military isolationist stance, but uh, intellectually, uh, then I think uh, we will all be the losers, not just the United States. Um, there are uh, many admirable uh, sides to America. Uh, there are, like in any other country, uh, there are also some darker sides to America, and I've become very much aware of, of both. I've also become aware how how fine the the balance is uh, the balance is between these two sides, uh, and uh, that uh, that the balance is not automatically is not something that is automatically maintained. Um, a lot depends on the type of leadership. Uh, uh, a lot depends on the, the, the breadth of vision of the leaders. Uh, uh, and a lot depends, as the world begins to change again, uh, a lot will depend on America's willingness to accept that it is no longer the paramount power in the world that the, the, the problems uh, that the world faces are so complex that unilateralism, that there's no place anymore for unilateralism, even for the largest military power in the world, uh, that problems uh, that we all face will have to be addressed collectively on a uh, basis of, uh, of equal rights uh, and uh, uh, trust. These are very difficult things for uh, lessons for a an, an, an major power to learn. Smaller powers learn through their history of defeats and, and, and so forth. America has not had that until the Vietnam War, and it took America a long time to, to, uh, 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 out, uh, to overcome uh, that trauma. Um, and one, one, one has seen the degree of irrationality that uh, kept intruding into American political behavior uh, immediately after the, after the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, uh, now, uh, a whole new set of problems uh, uh, is emerging of a, of a world system that uh, cannot be controlled or dominated by any single nation or groups of nations. 
uh, we will have to uh, find new mechanisms that uh, develop new mechanisms and uh, there is there have been in history uh, enough signs of uh, of great uh, political and organizational creativity um, after after Napoleon was one period when the nation state emerged and the mixture of of uh, the inf influence of the French Revolution and its reaction uh, uh, created uh, uh, new political systems. Uh, after World War II, there were very interesting, uh, very important uh, institutions uh, that were created. Um, we will have to do that once again. Uh, and it, it, it's very important that America does not underestimate itself. Uh, and got sort of get sort of uh, uh, discouraged by uh, the the lack of uh, willingness of countries to always toe the American line. Uh, the, uh, the the amount of uh, human talent and creativity that exists here, and the environment in which uh, that becomes possible, uh, the, the the creativity can express itself, is one of the major resources of the human community. Uh, and I hope that uh, that uh, that can happen. Now I've seen to come to the to the Ford Foundation experience. It was a major experience for me. Uh, I learned to understand the spirit of uh, of uh, American culture, American civilization. It was strangely enough a Dutch study that I read before I came to the United States for the first time that alerted me to the power of religion in American life. Uh, no other book uh, other, that I knew at that time um, saw America in that light. I've come to realize how, how even now uh, the, uh, the importance of religion and, and religious values has been on individual and collective American behavior and forms of organization. And the foundations are, I think, uh, the apex of that kind of, uh, that kind of spirit of giving, responsible giving. I learned many lessons. I learned also lessons about uh, uh, you know, how to oversee uh, large financial expenditures <laughs> and to use, see them used uh, responsibly. I've also seen some of the uh, how do you say that? Some of the parochialism uh, also, even among the best uh, uh, among the best Americans uh, who are who often sit on these boards. Um, the, uh, one of the very interesting things I discovered was how almost impossible it has been, although I think the, the, the barriers are beginning to break down, for American intellectuals to have a serious discussion about religion. Uh, it is as if Americans uh, uh, have free, seem, feel freer to talk about the sex life than about the religious life. Uh, 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 maybe because it's such a powerful force, but which uh, the intellectual does not admit uh, into uh, his uh, rationalizations. Uh, but the, the power is there. Uh, it's a, uh, the, there's certainly a revival of uh, religiosity in the United States in various forms, in, and in uh, positive as well as in negative directions. But. Uh, uh, in a world in which uh, religious intensity is going to increase, as I see it at least, uh, this element in, uh, in American life uh, will also uh, will be very important in, in the willingness to recognize uh, other religions, to study them, uh, 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 if only to try to uncover the fundamental roots of uh, the world views that, other cult that undergird other cultures. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, uh, the world needs uh, 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 more foundation, a more international foundations. The new foundation with, uh, of uh, Soviet American foundation that, is, that has recently been established is a major step forward. Uh, we, will, we will need more of those international foundations because many of the problems that we are going to face are of, of a global character and to leave the judgment of the appropriateness of various research projects or philanthropic activities 
should not be left to the rather arbitrary or, or historically determined, I suppose, and culturally determined perspectives of a single country and a single culture. We need, we need, uh, we are beginning to need international foundations. That's a very appropriate note indeed on which to end this very stimulating conversation which we've had with Ambassador Sojomotko. We thank you very much, sir, for appearing for this conversation and we hope that this isn't the first, I mean, we hope this isn't the last uh, of many trips uh, to Duke University and the United States. Uh, we thank also our two guests, uh, Professor Crawford Goodwin and Professor Malcolm Gillis, who've joined us in this conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Okay.